there, good day, good people. Welcome to this episode of MCM TV. I'm your host, Leon Carpenter, and today I am here with the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Bill Clements. Bill, thanks for sitting with me today. Bonsoir. <laughs> this is going to be a fun one today. Um, I, I tend to start with introductions, but you're here um, being interviewed solely, so we don't have to go through all of the introductions. But I do want to kind of rewind a little bit and talk a little bit of history. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll, we'll build up to where we're at now, and we'll talk about projects moving forward and that sort of thing. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Where were you born? Uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. So this area has kind of been home Absolutely. the entire time. You've never moved away and lived anywhere else? Pure Michigan. As the Pure phrase. Michigan. Yes, to coin the phrase. All right. Um, so as far as being a bass player and being a unique bass player, it wasn't always that way. You probably started when you were much younger. Yep, 13. You were 13 years old when you got your first bass. What inspired you to get involved with music? Well, uh, music ex itself, really. I think about the time, you know, I mean, uh, my folks weren't really particularly musically inclined. They're very World War II issue mentality. So okay. the, the, the stuff like the ink spots that my dad had in his record collection, when uh, interesting, though it is, they got five songs, you know, more than five. They all start the same way. But at any rate, um, yeah. I didn't really embrace music until I got to be about 13 or so, and it didn't seem like there was actually an actual rock and roll station around the house at that time. I got a radio around the time, I just started listening to things, and uh, and then I had a buddy named Paul Samra who uh, had, had taken some guitar lessons, and uh, just he happened to come over to the house to hang out, as you have buddies do at that sure. point. And, uh, yeah, he, he pulled his guitar and I was like, oh, you have guitar lessons? He's like, yeah, check it out. And he played the beginning of Pinball Wizard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy smokes, that's not something that just the incredibly, you know, British, uh, you know, gods can do. It's something that, you know, yeah, you just do it. Sure. And uh, around the same time, you know, like maybe you know, eighth, ninth grade. And uh, you're like, oh, everybody also happens to play guitar. I just, oh. So is that where you started? Did you start with a guitar then? Before moving no, no, bass? no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, you know, I just was very uh, moved by certain music, The Who, Rush, all that stuff. And I was like, well, everybody and his uncle plays the guitar. This is Zeke, everybody. Yeah, and he's going to be making appearances periodically throughout <laughs> the thing. Lay down. So you started with bass right off the bat? Well, no, I didn't want to play guitar because everybody else played guitar. Right, okay, that and makes sense. And a lot of guys who I considered to be uh, like, Wow, well, man, I was so wasted last week. I can play Black Sabbath. You yeah. know, those guys all played guitar, and I just couldn't relate to it. But as soon as I had, like, you know, a little bit of a radio in my room, I started, like, finding things like, you know, frankly, prog rock was the only thing that, like, The Who, uh, Yes... Uh, Rush, he's super trampy. Yeah, the police, absolutely mm -hmm. the police. Yeah, thanks, Jeffy. Absolutely the police. He was there for it all. My younger brother kind of saw the, you know, he's just, Jeff is just younger enough than me that he wasn't quite ready to jump in at the same point that I was, but he saw it all kind of happening. Right. You know, me, me staying up, like trying to figure out my generation late at night and stuff like that. You know, so the so those idea, were your those were your big influences in the beginning. Oh yeah, right? absolutely. Stuff that stuff. Stuff. Well, I mean, like I said, you can either play guitar, but I mean, any band can only have so many freaking guitar players in it. Right. You know, so I mean, what are you going to do? And all the really interesting stuff. And keep in mind, the alternative stuff to what like, what was popular was uh, Def Leppard, Motley Crue, um, the Hair Bands. Right. All right, I think it's a good time to take a break here. We're going we're gonna to take a pause for an MCM minute so we can get a feel for uh, some of his tracks. We'll see you back in 60 seconds.
Okay, um, let's talk about some of the early projects. You've already mentioned your brother's here. I understand you guys were in a band together, but tell me about some of the some of the projects you were involved with back in the beginning. Well, I, I, I honestly think that you, everybody starts playing other people's stuff. And, you know, like I, like I said, my, my buddy that, you know, had guitar lessons and I started a band together that played some high school dances. And even after we graduated high school, went and played like, you know, some college functions and some things like that. And it, all that stuff is really good, especially if you can pick the tunes you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've always been fairly fortunate, and I had some controlling interest in the projects where we're just going to do these tunes, and they're fun. But you still, ultimately, if you're really serious about what you're doing, what you want to play is the stuff that's in your head that no one else is doing. Right. I mean, quite frankly, if the, the stuff that I have in my head that I hear, if somebody else is putting out that record, I totally buy that record, but the only way I'm going to hear it is if I go to the trouble to make it myself. Right, okay. And that's that's basically what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Right on. So you made the switch from playing cover tunes to original music. Um, what were some of those projects? What were some of the band names that... Uh... Well, the first one was uh, Catharsis, which uh, uh, Tom tossed me that. Look at this. No, no, it's, no, it's, it's over there. Don't even worry about it. Yeah, bring it right in. First, the first real project I had that was original was uh, this band here, Catharsis. And based on the age of the uh, LP here, you can tell how long ago it was. But that, and that was recorded, uh, you know, about six months after I had my accident, actually. But I was, in ah, that, okay. I was in that band about six months prior to the accident, too. Did you always stay local to music? Have you gotten uh, out and toured a little bit at, at any point? Well... Um, you know, it, when you're playing your own stuff, it's not like... It, well, back in the day, there were two options. You could play, like, the Peppers circuit, which is the aforementioned breaded hairband circuit, or you could play the classic rock circuit, and you can travel around and do that stuff. If you're playing your own music, your, your options are basically, uh, before the internet, mind you, uh, farm yourself out with other bands that you've played shows with and slowly work your way around and... You're talking like you send letters out and things like that. This was even before, like, MySpace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, networking, running into people. The, the, the way I, I first got outside of Michigan was when I was, the guys who were in this band, after I was rather unceremoniously asked to leave, but that's all hindsight, um, all moved on to do other things. The guitar player, Nick, who's a good friend of mine still, was out in San Francisco. Okay. And at this time, there was actually still a scene there. The real estate boom hadn't happened to such a degree that if you didn't have a, a Silicon Valley income, mm -hmm. that you could afford to find a place to live there, you know, like the Mission District or sure. stuff like that. But anyway, so um, they were playing shows out there with their band, and Nick got in touch with me and said, why don't you come on out? So we loaded up the Astro Van, me, my brother, a fellow named Mike Yant, who's a savant of drums, and our buddy Derek Metzinger, who was sort of our roadie sound man, mm -hmm. and we just went out there and played a bunch of song, uh, shows out in San Francisco in, in the Bay Area, and uh, you know, actually went over quite well. Some of the notable Bay Area musicians thought we were cool and were wondering when we were going to come back, but we had you know, the resources to just sort of make a make a run of that. Any of those shows memorable that stick out, stand out? Oh, okay. the, the, yeah, well, I mean, we went out there with the attitude that we were going to, like, uh, take no prisoners, and, right. you know, when you're that young, and you're that full of energy, and, uh, yeah, we were determined, and I think we accomplished our goal. We Jeffrey just, wasn't that bad with you. Absolutely, it was just me, Jeff, and a drummer, it was That's a power nice. trio, yeah. Wow, nice. Yeah, that was, the, that was the original kill switch that, uh, you know, often gets confused with the other kill switches. Which are basically one Lock, kill switch that keeps one, two, yeah. and three. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which versions ought point oh and all that stuff. But uh, Jeffy, we need more cookies. Hey, how about Jeffy? Okay, just cut the whole box. You want to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we can do that. Let me um, let me ask you uh, um, another quick question before we uh, maybe take another break and come back for the next segment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the equipment as well that you play with. No, no worries. Mr. Jeff Clements, ladies and gentlemen. 
Oh yeah. David Brown. Um, let's talk about some of your equipment. So. Well, yeah. What do you, what, what would you like? Well, let's 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 tires, let's man? talk about uh, some of the equipment to your left there. We've got a couple of bases. One of them is, is quite unique. I don't think it's entirely in frame here, but maybe well, we'll shoot some footage this, of it this later. Guy, this, this guy here I, I brought out especially for this because this is about Michigan, and this is a Michigan-made base. Right on. Made by, by a guy uh, named uh, Doug Jones out of Ann Arbor, a good friend of mine who uh, uh, back about 10 years ago we uh, went out to the NAMM show a couple times and had some fun and kind of tried to introduce the instrument. Uh, he actually is one of those fellas that is a renaissance man and has many fingers and many pies and he's just focused on other things right now. He, sure. might, he might revisit the instrument at some point if sufficient interest uh, sort of warranted it. Okay, great. So y'all contact Doug Jones out of Ann Arbor. There you go. Jones MFG Music. I think the uh, website's still up there. What about the other two axes you have over there? Uh, well, that right there is the Bill Clement signature model from Regenerate Guitar Works. Wonderful. Yep, and uh, that's uh, that one right there is an old friend of mine, Marco Cortez, made that one right there. Okay. And you know, it's I, I you know, got a lot of guys who uh, are believers in what I do, so they want to lend their lend their energy. Uh, to it, and I'm very grateful for it because Lord knows I wouldn't be anywhere without them and everybody else who sort of views what I do as valid and listenable. Right. All right, and we're sitting here uh, split With, by a couple of Blackport speaker yeah, cabinets. Michigan's own Blackport, Blackport speaker cabinets, actually. Right. Black sport. That sounds a little racy. You're calling me sport. I don't like that. Nor call me skippy. Take it easy, Slick. Yeah. <laughs> Real, relax, Francis. We have we have Tom Miller from Blackboard Speaker Cabinets in the house here. And if you'd like to learn more about Blackboard Speaker Cabinets, we're gonna, we're going to obviously get Bill's opinion here. But um, we did do a feature on them. You can find it on our homepage. So please check that out and visit their their website as well. So t tell me what drew you to these here. Well, actually, uh, Tom approached me and said. Uh, we would like you to stress test these because I think he was pretty well aware that I would stress test them in ways no one else would. <laughs> and I have. All right. And I have, and I think that the uh, R and D process of our relationship has yielded some very productive developments. We've improved since we met you. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. Is this the cabinet of choice? I know he's here in the room, but I want your honest opinion. Well, yeah, because I'll tell you, um, front-loaded speaker cabinets, they produce a nice sound right next to you, but it's deceptive because, the, as you well know, uh, you've played around a little bit, what you hear right next to you is not what's being heard out in the room. Mm -hmm. So whatever whatever vanity I've had in terms of like, oh, I want the, what's in my ear to sound just a certain way, has always uh, negatively affected the sound in the room. It took it took years of watching like all kinds of bass players, like blues bass players, old rock and roll bass players, even some of those heavy metal hairy band bass players, uh, <laughs> to realize that you know the low end is really the thing that holds it together. Right. So, and there was also a, a certain degree of vanity that I had in the like I want all these noodly riffs I've got going to really cut through, <laughs> and at the expense of the sound of the overall band. You know, and I, I fully admit to being guilty of that, but I think a lot of people are when they're young. But bottom line is, what sounds good in the room, unless you're on a stage which is running at 3,000 watt PA and all that stuff, if, if, if your rig that you're running in the room is really your only recourse, and the PA is just vocal PA, then you need something that throws that nice, low, warm end out there and these do so you've got lots of equipment here um, you said that's a signature series so there are endorsements involved here oh absolutely and uh, you know they're not big corporate types um, I find I, I, I tend to find myself at odds with that mentality they're, you know guys like you know little little one or two man outfits like Marco or, or Tom or the guys out in Washington who are Mark and Rod at Regenerate you know, I, I, you know, all of these people, I don't just waltz up and say, hey, I need a bass. And that's, uh, I, get, I get a lot of Facebook messages like, hey, how do I get an endorsement and everything? It's like, I, I don't know how to go get one. I only know that 
if you do what you do to a certain degree, if it's meant to happen, people will start to approach you and ask you to like say, hey, you know, I think maybe you could work with our stuff. And that's that's really the way it goes. I I, I don't uh, you know I, I don't pursue endorsements you know any more than I ever really pursued women. It's just if they're if they're interested, they're interested. If they're not, they're not. All right. Well, well put. I think on that note, we'll take another break for another MCM minute. Here's another example of Bill's fine skills. We'll see you in six seconds. Okay, welcome back from another example. Um, let's talk a little bit about the press that you've been involved with as of late. Um, I'm sure you've been covered for quite some time, but things seem to be heating up right now. Um, what are some of the things that come to mind? Well, you know, I think it's basically social media has worked in. It's, it's, it's an odd conundrum because I really wouldn't have a social media thing at all if I wasn't playing music because it seems like an oxymoron to me, social media. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, based on the fact that uh, I've been getting out to the trade shows in Los Angeles and doing things, networking with other musicians, you know, the, the, I, I hesitate to use the word viral because it sounds derogatory and it would be the first time I've been referred to that way. <laughs> so, uh, that having been said, yeah, the internet and, and just recently, uh, both the English, the big English bass magazine and the big American bass magazine have both mentioned me lately. There's also been a pretty uh, popular audio interview that was done by a website called Entertainment Drive Through, and uh, th it, the weirdest thing about that is they shared a photo, uh, an old photo off uh, my very very first record on the Ravion Bass that you can uh, still get if you want to go to see Baby Got Come or anyway, the stuff's out there. So anyways, at any rate, they, and actually they used kind of a poorly worded quote out of something I'm, you know, we talked for a long time like we're doing right now, and I, I made a, a remark about, you know, basically individual, individuality as a musician and trying to do what you do and make it a thing that people actually respond to without not making it you or compromising what you're trying to express. Mm -hmm. And it was really popular, and I think it got like a, a thousand shares in 24 hours and stuff like that. So well, that classifies as viral. Maybe a small outbreak. <laughs> well, there's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing small about my outbreaks, pal. Trust me. <laughs> That's great. So, what other what other types of things like that have you uh, experienced? Well, well, You've met a lot of people, haven't you? Well, sure. Uh, you know, the NAM show is a is a trade. It is a trade show for musical instruments and manufacturers thereof and things sure. associated with that. And, uh, you know, I just basically get out there in what I call booth jockey, which is I'll get out there and I'll, I'll play at, say, the string company's booth, who's Callium Strings, that's my string company. I'll go there and I'll play for like three, four hours straight, and then I'll go over to Re Regenerate Guitar Works booth and play three or four hours there. And it's, you know, it's on the West Coast, so a lot of high-profile types show up there. And I, you know, about two years ago, Stevie Wonder happened to hear what I was doing from a couple booths away, and... Hmm. Was, felt compelled to seek it out, which to me uh, is probably the most single validating thing that's ever happened. Because if you understand the NAM show, you realize there's a sea of bass, you know, wizards out there doing their thing. Sure. And Stevie's played with everybody from James Jamerson on up to Nate Watts, who's a friend of mine and a really great player. Uh, but he felt compelled to have his people come and say, hey, where's that coming from? And let me go over there. 
So he came over and was like curious as like he, you know, here's a guy who can obviously discern every single note I'm playing, but he couldn't reconcile the notes he was hearing with how he was told it was being achieved. So he's like, how are you doing that? And I did my best to explain it to him and told him that he was basically a musical god and probably got a little gushy and he went on about his business. <laughs> right, and I think as anybody would, right? Well, uh, you know, I told him that, you know, the best, some of the best bass lines ever made came off the left, left off his left hand on the keyboards, right. you know, and it's yeah. true. The guy's brilliant. That's a nice compliment. Well, no, he's the single most relevant musician that's still alive today, I'd say. Was so. this, was this um, brief uh, encounter documented? Yeah, actually, there's a little YouTube clip of it before one of his cadre of security people uh, slapped the camera out of whoever was following him around. But there's, uh, a, there's actual proof that this happened, and I'm not just telling uh, fish stories. How long of a clip is that? Maybe uh, 30 seconds with 10 seconds of Stevie and I talking. And about I can find it on YouTube? Oh, absolutely you can. All right, let's take a really, really short break, because I don't see a minute, but hey, take a look. This is Bill with Stevie. <laughs> See, he wasn't bullshitting you there. All right. <laughs> with this guy, you never can tell. I'm just kidding with you, of course. Um, no, no, all right. no. My dad's a used car salesman. So ah, right on. I come by it honest. Uh, very good. Take very my good. wife, please. All right. So, um, if I may, I want to move on to maybe one of the more sensitive topics, but maybe also the one that the audience is probably most curious about. You're a unique bass player. You play with one hand because uh, you were involved with an accident years ago. When did this happen? <laughs> and, uh, and maybe what happened? Are you uh, okay with talking about that? Yeah, well, industrial accident. I was a kid working in a factory and probably not really too well suited for it. You know. Okay. But yeah, I uh, basically put my hand someplace where I shouldn't have. And things weren't really particularly set up very well to accommodate someone who was sort of a greenhorn in that area. Okay. So it was a combination of design error and, you know, human error. How old were you when this happened? 21. 21. So you'd already been playing for a number of years. That was obviously quite a few years ago now at this point. So at some point, if you excuse me for using a cliche, you got back up on that horse. How, how long did it take for that or wh what, what compelled you to, to adapt and continue on with your craft? Uh, you know, I just was not going to quit. Very good. No, I didn't have that. I don't. I don't have any back down in me. Uh, jowl towels right there. Anyway, um, yeah. The I jowl don't. towel. Look, it's it, the jowl towel. All right. Yeah, I, I, you know, however ill-advised it might be that I should have some back down in me, I really don't have any. And Great. I'm just not prepared to stop. And you know, that's all it was. Do you I take mean, a little bit of a break for a little while? No. 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 I. Uh, I actually recall very distinctively when I was in the emergency room with Ernie, the washroom attendant, holding my tourniquet, uh, asking my girlfriend at the time to uh, find out about the Chapman stick and see about ordering one. I am hip to the Chapman stick. I lived, this is going to kind of, I'm taking a little you know bit of Emmett? a tangent here. Um, no, but um, I lived in San Francisco for a couple of years from 89 to 91. I was right, going right. what time are you guys out there? Around, kind of around. 93. 93, so just shortly after, I was, I was already gone from there, but um, I was downtown one night, and there was this old man just rocking the Chapman stick, and this guy was in another plane, and it, it was the first time I'd ever been exposed to it, even though back then, at that time, I was a guitar player. Yeah, I wasn't was hip to Chapman it. Stick. The, Chapman, the Chapman stick is, is more or less just the neck of a guitar, but it's got guitar strings and bass strings on it. So you can play bass riffs here, and then you can you can hammer on all your different guitar yeah, chords. It's, it's, it's very Stu Ham-esque, in well, a sense. Well, it's built to be played, uh, you know, counterpoint. You're supposed to be, you know, accompanying yourself with your, like, mm -hmm. basically like a vertical piano, almost. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I was a big King Crimson fan, so I was aware of Tony Levin's work on that. And to me, already by the time I was, you know, in the, you know, the accident happened, there was a, I'd say, a 30 to 45 minute lag time between when the uh, ambulance arrived and when it happened. 
Actually, I believe the lawyers arrived before the ambulance did. <laughs> they probably just smelled yeah. blood and showed up. Do we cheat them and how? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, exactly. So but good. bottom line is, uh, by the time I'd gotten to the hospital and there was literally the janitor still holding my tourniquet in the emergency room, I was starting to think about, you know, the Chapman stick might be the way to go. He's, because of the nature of the accident, when it happened, it was not a severance, it was a mutilation. And I knew there was no, nothing to put back together. Right. You know. So by the time I'd actually gotten to the hospital, uh, I was having uh, my my girlfriend at the time. Her name was Marty. I had her uh, start looking up uh, Emma Chapman and say, explain that there's a bass player who needs something along mm-hmm. those lines. And he's, he, you know, he, I, we. Actually, my, my dad's friends who worked at Kellogg's uh, in, in Battle Creek, which is, I was working at a pilot plant for that, uh, through a temporary agency. But anyway, they all took up a collection, and uh, they, they got the money together to send me, uh, to get me a Chapman stick. Really? Yeah, it took several months to get to me, and by the time I'd got hold of it, I'd actually figured out how to play the bass in such a way that it was effective. Now the Chapman stick's a marvelous instrument, but it doesn't really sound like a bass guitar. And mm-hmm. I think so, I played that more than you did. <laughs> yeah, you, you probably did. And most of it is designed to be played with your right hand and the belt hook and everything. It just er- ergonomically didn't fit right. Mm-hmm. And uh, literally, by the time it had showed up, I'd figured out how to do what I do on an actual regular bass guitar with no real structural modification to make it, you know, playable with one hand. Just right. s- setting it up right. What the hell did you think when that happened? I was devastated. Right. Yeah, but it, it sounds to me that it never even crossed your mind that you're not going to be able to play anymore. You immediately thought, how do I adapt to be able to continue playing? On the factory floor, between the time when it happened and the time when I got to the emergency room, yeah, I kind of thought things were over. But at some point on the ambulance ride over, I started to get gripping, saying, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to quit. If I live through this, I'm not going to that's fantastic. So, obviously, you're, you're achieving great things with your music, but how has it also maybe helped you to impact other people's lives? Well, you know, the fact that this happened some 20-odd years ago, um, I've been doing it a long time, and it was back in, I, I'd say, probably about 2005 when the bass community became kind of aware of what I was doing, and the, the videos and the magazine articles that have come out have sort of kind of circulated through the cultural consciousness and up to the point where, you know, young people who have been congenitally uh, amputees, I mean, being born without a limb, mm-hmm. uh, and some fellas that I know who actually have a good friend uh, down in Texas who lost his arm because of his dentist, uh, because when he went uh, to get anesthetized for a surgical procedure, they messed up his IV, and he ended up losing his... Uh, arm from below wow. the elbow from that. Oh yeah, that's right. Anytime you get an IV and if somebody doesn't do it right or they put the wrong thing in there, you can end up in a pretty bad situation. But at any rate, he you know, like heard about me and came up and you know contacted me. So I said, come on up and we'll spend a weekend together and I'll try to show you what I can. He was probably the first guy that came up. His name's Pat Murphy. He's running around Texas still being a good guy and everything doing his thing. Um, my buddy my buddy Ken McCaw from Toronto, who's a stroke victim, who, uh, you know, has a, had a catastrophic stroke that pretty much uh, rendered his right side immobile, mm-hmm. but he was an accomplished musician and probably a much more knowledge, knowledgeable musician than I am, frankly, but, you know, some of his friends turned him on to my videos and he contacted me and said, well, yeah, come on down. And actually, guys like that, really, uh, it takes maybe five minutes of me just maybe making a minor adjustment to how they do things to get them back on the right track and playing in what I would consider a active, meaningful manner. Sure. You know, it's just the difference between you can see it, but then if you actually do it, you know. So, you know, and obviously the whole time I've been pursuing whatever inner musical demons I've been driven by, I wasn't really consciously trying to help people or anything like that. And I would be misrepresenting myself to come across as some sort of Albert Schweitzer, mm-hmm. but in, in the uh, 
in the whole scope of what I do, if me pursuing my goals help other people get to their goals, then I consider it a win-win situation for everyone. And I've said that before, and I'm being redundant, but it's true. That's fantastic. Well, let's take one more break, and then I think I might want to bring a couple of the, the friends the and crew. relatives that are here, let's maybe to give a, a few words here. here. Um, we're going to take our last MCM minute here, and we're going to get some, uh, some live footage of Bill playing. So enjoy this, and then come on back. We'll see you in 60 seconds. <laughs> something new tonight we're gonna to bring in some friends and family and uh, get some outside perspective maybe some history or some stories or whatever the case may be we've never done this so um, we're just gonna give it a try so first please introduce yourself and how you know Bill my name is Herb Ledbetter mm -hmm. uh, local bass player in many projects over mm -hmm. the years and uh, I met Billy through you know, through the shows uh, back early 90s Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I guess it would probably be 1990 when I met him, but just through shows and just, you know, met him at playing gigs together and I've known him ever since and right on. now we're very close. How would you sum up, Bill? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've known him for a very long time, so if you, if you know him for as long as I have, you know, he's like any of us. I, I've seen him, like, grow up to some extent. We didn't know each other when we were kids, but... Um, and he's four years older than me, and when I met him, I was probably 17. So, mm -hmm. you know, we were, you know, we were just still growing up in our 20s, whenever it was. Um, so I've seen many sides of him, but uh, I, I don't know. He's he's a loyal friend, and you know, very opinionated. And when you're a musician, you know, it's like like we were saying on the side and in some outtake stuff, it's completely subjective. So. If anyone's mm -hmm. seen Bill and and knows Bill, much like the company you keep, we're like minded and strong opinions about everything. So wonderful. You know, well, hey, he thank could, you. He could he could do anything he wants. He's Thanks for your input on all of that. Absolutely. Wonderful. Hey, who wants to roast Bill a little bit here? Come on, Jeff. <clears throat> thank you for joining us. Please introduce no yourself. Uh, I'm Jeff Clements, uh, Bill's younger brother. All right. Played with him uh, a lot over the years. Yeah, something tells me that we could probably tell stories all night long. Yes, probably could. What are some yeah. of your favorite memories? Uh, you know, honestly, there's a bunch of uh, really off-color stuff that I could probably bring up. <laughs> uh, being that this is the internet, there would be no holds barred, I assume. But honestly, uh, you know, one of the things that sticks out most to me in my mind is um, when Bill and I <clears throat> first started playing together, um, he actually uh, did me a huge solid and actually bought me my first really nice guitar and really nice amp that, I mean, I played on and through shit up until that point and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's, uh, it meant a lot to me and still does. So he's been having an impact on people since even Absolutely. long before that. And I, answer. you know, I don't honestly, I don't, I don't know if I would have found the fact that I'm musically inclined if it wasn't for Bill. Fantastic. Well, hey, thanks for your input on that. No problem whatsoever. Wonderful. And just so you folks at home know, I'm in a project now called International. <laughs> our, yeah. album, our album <laughs> drops on uh, July 19th. Very good. How about a Facebook page or, or a website that they can uh, go to? www.xinternationalx.com. And there are uh, some 
some uh, demos and actually on SoundCloud as well under International there is some uh, actual snippets from the record itself. Wonderful. So, yes. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. You got a few things to say? Come on in. Sure. All right, thanks for sitting with us. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm James Powell. Okay, and how do you know Bill? I've known him over the years, um, just in the music scene. You know, I remember seeing Kill Switch a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing about Catharsis a long time ago. You know, I had some good friends that have been big, huge fans. My friend Mike Rosenbaum and his brother were close friends. Mm -hmm. And just over the years, just, I always had you know fun watching him play and now I'm just beginning to you know, jam with them right now. Right on. So uh, you haven't been in any past projects? No, just kind of new. <clears throat> just been friends all this time, and now here you are playing with them. Yeah, I never thought I'd actually play with a guy, but it's just kind of nice to finally get the opportunity and see some you know, friends that have been around the community for a while. Right. And is it grooving pretty well? Yeah, I'm having a great time. Wonderful. So you've known them then since you were a lot younger. kids? <laughs> yeah, since you guys were kids. Yeah, in my 20s. Any, uh, any fond memories? Anything that stands um, out? Um, just a couple times, like uh, I remember going to Dylan's and uh, we were, uh, Bill had his Fadula bass, and I remember helping him do some intonation on it. You know, every time I've seen him, he was always cool with me, and always had a great time. Wonderful, cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. This is this is kind of a cool segment. I'm kind of digging this. Is it picking up, Tom? Yeah, well, I right you want to come in and have a few words? All right. You, you know, I I would have to say that. Uh, Hold on. Let me let me get you to introduce yourself. So oh, okay. so so next we have. Uh, my name is Tony Thompson. I uh, owned and operated the uh, studio where uh, some of Bill's material was recorded. Now, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You said <laughs> some of his material. I understand that these couple of uh, jewel case boxes that just showed up is, you're calling some material? Well, I say that because I know that he's recorded elsewhere as, as well. So um, it, it just afforded uh, us both an opportunity to learn and grow uh, and uh, I'd say over the course of uh, maybe approximately about five years, I think mm -hmm. I think we've known each other. Um, you know, we've, I've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I've learned a lot just through the experience of knowing him, and uh, uh, just various musicians coming in the studio, who, whomever he might bring. You know, so it, it's been a tremendous experience just knowing him. There's, I don't know. There's a, a hundred discs up here. Is this is each disc different material? Uh, I believe so. Yes, yes. Each each disc is. Bill. Bill, Yo. Wait, come back in here for a minute. This is all unique material on each of these discs here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And this was all recorded in his studio. Oh, well, that's just a portion of it. I think we deleted about four years' worth of stuff just to make room on the memory. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you've, you've had a big part in his creativity then. Every, every Friday. Every Friday, barring a gig or maybe something I had going on, every Friday, we just get together and... Uh, I'd set the recorder in motion and, and it get it rolling and and he played drums on a lot of that stuff. When yeah. some nights when we didn't have a drummer, Tony would play drums. So you're a drummer. Yeah, drummer, drummer. bass player. He'd play everything really. Right on. So the, the studio that you have is it a private studio or is it a studio that's available to other musicians? What's um, currently I'm in the process of moving. So when I get to my next destination, hopefully soon, then I'll be up and running. And uh, yeah, I plan to maybe go a little bit more public. You know, Do you have a name for it? Tomcat Recording. T -H Tom Cat Recording. T H O M, T H O M K A T. Right on. Mm -hmm. Check out Tom Cat Recording. Hey, thank you very much for sitting down with us. All right, thank you. All right. All right. We we wanted to bring her back in a little bit because him being a, a bass player as well, he understands more of the technical aspects of what Bill's doing. Everybody shared some great comments on the character and his creativity and that sort of thing. So, how do you feel about him as a bass player? Uh, well, I, that's what we were referring to earlier when I first met. Bill, um, you know, as bass players, we sort of were, you know, immediately drawn to each other when we were playing gigs together and stuff. Um, but I, what I thought was the most fascinating was uh, as bass players and similar uh, influences and taste, um, you know, The Who, Yes, Rush, um, The Police, uh, Iron Maiden, of course, as a bass player, everybody, uh, you know, all of all bass players are Iron Maiden, Rush, Who guys. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found most fascinating, I didn't meet him till after his accident, um, and a lot of people think that his sound is sort of unique because of that, but mm -hmm. I'm not so sure of that. I think 
I think he probably would have ended up as like a more of a stand-up bass player because it's just more organic. Um, it's more the natural style of the instrument. But like you were asking me earlier about Billy's personality, I don't think his personality allowed would have allowed him to sound like Getty or sound like John Entwistle or sound like anyone or any of the stand-up bass players. Um, very proficient uh his his technique lends its style to Jocko he's a big you know it's obviously mm -hmm. big Jocko Pistorius influence but I don't even think he sounds very much like Jocko sort of Jocko Billy Sheehan because he's very groovy and it's just fascinating to me that as unique as he is it's he he doesn't sound like any of his influences you know he's he's and managed he to he didn't before his accident being, right. Yeah, he's, he's somebody that was around prior to the accident. He was definitely his own man, his own bass player before the accident even happened at a very, you know, 21 years old. Right. Um, yeah, I think the personality actually comes through in his technique more than any physical aspect of it. It's, it's fascinating. That's why I agree. He's the king. All right. You know? Well, thanks for that input. I think I think I want to bring him back in here and talk about some upcoming projects and then get him uh, get him rocking out on this Great. this upright bass in here. Thanks. thanks Skinner. All right, Bill, come on back in here. We're gonna, we're gonna bring this thing to a close before uh, before everything melts down. <laughs> it's about to. It gets hot up underneath these lights. It does. All right, some guys here seem to have uh, some pretty nice things to say about you. Well, they're great guys, and I I think I, I'm I'm totally comfortable being judged by the company I keep. Wonderful. All right, so let's let's kind of start to bring this thing to a close here. What kind of upcoming projects do you have in the works right now? Well, uh, we've got the uh, Bill Clements Axiom prog rock album Kickstarter project that's going to be happening uh, here okay. very soon. Has that launched yet? It hasn't launched yet. No, it hasn't launched quite yet. Uh, we've got to nail a couple other little details down, right. but it'll be okay. up soon. And uh, quite frankly, it's just about making sure this next batch of songs that I've got put together get out and get heard and get presented in kind of... it's it's. It's been uh, since 2005 that I actually put out a record in a fully realized form. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go to cdbaby.com, you can find the records I've done to, that are just simply for download. And there's a couple of them. Uh, but it's not the same thing as doing a full project that you right. know, gets, you know. I'm still a big fan of the physical disc. Absolutely. You, you get all the artwork that's involved with, with and, the and physical if the, disc. And if the Kickstarter project meets its goal, we're going to do a limited run of 12-inch uh, LPs and stuff like that. Fantastic. So that's that's also something I've kind of had an itch to do for a long time is put out the, the full-on project with the, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen a 12-inch vinyl. Yeah. Wait a minute. They're starting to come back, though, aren't they? <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> there's another, there's another referring to, uh, yeah, I know, I was yeah. trying to deflect so, that one a little the, bit. Those 12 inch vinyls have never gone anywhere. They're still there. A lot of the woodwork. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, it, it, it would work. But, yeah. bottom line is, yeah, it, the, the idea is to put, uh, put together a project that gets fully released, gets to the people that really want to hear it. Right. Because, uh, all the bells and whistles. Bells, whistles, and the fact that. All my friends in India, all my friends in South America, you know, everybody who is like, let me know that what I'm doing kind of resonates with them. Should get a fucking Kickstarter program going. I think that might be the thing to do. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, you know, they've all kind of spoken and said, hey, if we just had some stuff from you, we'd be all about it. So. Wonderful. We're gonna deliver the stuff here as All soon right. as possible. Keep your eyes open for that. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this one to a close. I really want to thank you for taking the time to sit down. I want to thank everybody else that was here, especially having a seat and and sharing some words. I, I'm uh, I'm really thankful for that. Thank you. So um, my boys, I love them all. All right, well, we're going to bring this one to a close. So if you want to learn a little bit more about Bill Clements, you can visit him on his Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com slash Bill Clements. Once that Kickstarter project comes out, I'm sure I'll be posting all about it. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about myself, you can visit my fan page. Just go to facebook.com slash 
Leon Carpenter fans. And as always, please visit MotorCityMusicians.com. You'll see other interviews such as this one here. There is a forum. There's a calendar of events. There's a YouTube button that'll take you to our YouTube channel. We'll be able to see the extended version of this crazy interview here, as well as other interviews for other bands. So for MCM TV, till next time, I'm Leon Carpenter. Keep the music alive. Bam! Take that. Woo!